Hello and welcome to Stupid Ancient History with Midgley and Taylor and our resident expert, non-expert, with special guest James. The science still by, we're not changing his name. Brilliant, thanks for that. Hello. Hello. As always, we're wearing togas, we're in a small stinky room, um, and today we're going to look at Herodotus of Halicarnassus. Boo! <laughs> <laughs> what have I told you about that before? So, throughout the course of the Persians, you'll hear us regularly refer to and quote this chap called Herodotus. Yeah, uh, uh, you've kind of called him the father of history, haven't you? I'm assuming he's a man. He is, yeah. Um, like we said, Herodotus is often regarded as the father of history. He wrote the first written history, and he's actually responsible for the word history. It comes from the Greek historia, which means inquiry. Oh, okay. Well, so, he, so even before he became a historian, he was named... He, he, he was named history. He basically no. He he made it up. Oh, okay, he made okay. up the word history. Ah, okay. But there were. He's not the first person to write stuff down. People did document events People before. People did, but there were kind of descriptions, but they were kind of chronicles. So there were descriptions of what had happened. Okay. So Herodotus is different because he starts by asking the question, "Why does something happen?" Oh, okay. So that's the difference. So it's more of an actual inquiry as opposed to just a just description of rather something than or a story. Stuff that happens. Right, yeah. Okay. So specifically in terms of why Greece and Persia went to war, he tries to explain the reasons why that conflict happens in the first place. Okay. So he, yeah, he's the first guy to actually do so where, conceptual history. So whereabouts in history are we at this point then? Well, Herodotus is writing mid mid 400s okay so it's after the persian wars right okay and it's way after people like cyrus and the early persian kings okay so even though he's asking why he goes way 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 back right um even back to the trojan war so it'd be like writing uh, it'd be right in the why the british elections turned out how they did but going back to the norman conquest right okay so he's leaving no stone unturned and making some stones mountains. Yeah. Uh, so you call him earlier Herodotus of Halicarnassus, was it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't sound Persian. He wasn't. He was Greek. That yeah. That sounds <laughs> better. Well, more, more in keeping. Um, does he not have a conflict of interest then, right, about Persian history if he's Greek? Well, you could see it as one. Herodotus was born in Halicarnassus, which is kind of modern day Turkey which was basically in and out of the Persian Empire. So this is why. How, how would they go in and out? Just liberate themselves, got reconquered? Usually or? through wars. Okay. Yeah. So he's the most kind of complete and reliable source for the Persian kings. Okay. Um, but I'm starting to think he's not the best writer from what we've heard about him. I mean, Mr. Midgley's starting to go very red in the face <laughs> and there's smoke coming out of his ears. Mm. We've got to be very careful uh, because Mr. Midgley has shall we say, more than a passing fondness for Herodotus. I mean, Absolutely. Let's call a spade a spade, a man crush. A man crush. <laughs> I mean, he is trying to model himself on Herodotus, as we can see at the moment. Well, I'm from old, dead and green. Facial... <laughs> no, I was meaning from your uh, ever-growing kind of facial hair. <laughs> <I> just... <laughs> I'm going to do something in lockdown. <laughs> so. No, he is awesome. Says you. So, given Herodotus is such an important source... You, you say he's important, he's, there's issues with him. Oh, oh yeah. careful! Yeah. I, even I think already there are yeah. issues with him. He does have, um, he does have some issues, uh, but we're going to put Herodotus on trial! <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's going down. <laughs> so, Midgley, it again. is your job to defend Herodotus and convince us that Herodotus is actually worth reading. Easy. He's, he's quite a hefty book. I mean, I think you could beat someone senseless with that. Yeah, I've only just seen this book, and it is a big book with very small text. Yes, it's chunky. Chunky. Uh, oh, so, good. So you've got to defend him, and what yep. are we doing? Just pointing out all the nonsense he says. Yeah, we just get to poke fun at him, basically, which I think is something that we're both very good at doing, so I don't think that this will be too difficult for I me. Think, and I you. think this is good. We can do this. Boo. So, without further ado, let's begin the trial of Herodotus. <laughs>
So we're going to start the proceedings off. So I'm putting a best uh, prosecution voice. Oh. <laughs> uh, we should point out James is actually wearing a judge's wig as we speak. I mean, I've all been wearing this the whole time. <laughs> You've only just noticed. We just thought that he was trying to cover up his hair. <laughs> He was oh, on trial here. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, I'm, swap, I'm switching sides. I'm not having this. <laughs> oh, dear. Sorry. Anyway, we need to be serious now, James. Oh, do we? <laughs> who, who, oh, it's who was. Who's stopping that from happening? <laughs> so, our first point that we're going to say is that there are too many gaps and too many bits of folklore within Herodotus' work. So, his research, his research even seems to be a little bit shoddy. <laughs> Dinging. Well, since you can't even say <laughs> research. Um, yeah, fair, fair point, fair comment. There are lots of gaps and discrepancies in Herodotus. Some things that are seemingly unimportant, he gives us great long descriptions of, um, like Egypt. Uh, other things like important battles, he just says there was a battle and it was pretty hard. <laughs> I, I, I think I might have made this comparison before. Very much like Tolkien. Yeah. Like he'll spend, if you ever, don't read Lord of the Rings, they're a waste of time. <laughs> but um, if, if, you read, if you read them, he'll spend about a chapter describing a tree and then a sentence describing a battle. It's really frustrating to yeah. read. There, there are, yeah, the, it's similar with Herodotus, but to be fair to Herodotus, it's not his fault, whereas it's entirely Tolkien's fault. Yeah. Um, the issue of research is, is a big one. Herodotus, we do know, what little we do know about him. He did do an awful lot of primary research. He travelled extensively around um, the Aegean and the Mediterranean. He spoke to Greeks, Persians, Egyptians. He was basically going on holiday asking everyone, but why? But and why? And that's fine, but does he actually analyse that information well, or the source of that information? Because that's the thing, isn't it? If yeah. he's not doing that, then he's not really kind of utilising the skills that we would necessarily think of as being something that a, a modern historian Absolutely. would use and Absolutely. would have. But um, yeah, he does util he does he is critical of a lot of these stories. He does where there's different accounts suggest that the ones he thinks are more or less plausible. Um, but yeah, the problem he has is ultimately he's relying on oral tradition. He's re relying on spoken word accounts because people didn't record things mm. from so, how long after the fact well it depends if it's about the persian wars 20 30 years afterwards so within people's lifetimes yeah. if we're talking cyrus the great hundreds of years right so yeah he's he's often described as being a first-rate research but a second-rate historian there is folklore there are gaps but it's not necessarily his fault it's what he's working with I know this is going a bit more into like his him as a person rather than his work. Um, mm -hmm. You say he travelled a lot. How yeah. did he afford that? Was he just from a wealthy? He family? was. Yeah, he was from a wealth. He was independently wealthy. He right, was basically yeah. on a massive gap here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, accusation two. Uh, he makes a lot of stuff up. Seemingly, there's a lot of nonsense. A lot about gods coming. From down from the heavens etc. A lot about things coming out of people's bits, you know, like trees and vines and, vines and floods of way. Yeah, Admittedly, they, they were dreams. They're the slightly more believable <laughs> bits. <laughs> yeah, again, fair cop, but again, I'll use the same defence. Give him a break. It's 2,400 years ago when he's writing. Um, and some of it is partly down to his, <coughs> excuse me, the material he's working with, where people pass on stories, particularly in Greek literary tradition. Gods are used throughout the ancient world to explain things. Obviously, Herodotus is writing a history, not a story, an epic poem like Homer. But it's within that Greek tradition to use kind of signs, omens, and things, supernatural explanations. And Herodotus, at the time he's writing, he's not really in a position to separate himself from that without coming under some pretty harsh criticism. He lives in a world that believes in the supernatural. So there was no like secular part of the world that would be like, no, this is what happened, take gods out of it. Well, it, it starts to come afterwards, so Thucydides, who follows off after Herodotus, he takes up Herodotus' baton and runs with it. When he's writing about the Peloponnesian War, he doesn't include any kind of supernatural or um, otherworldly aspect, which is why he's so dull. He's dull, <laughs> dull, dull. It's like choking on sand. Um, 
But Herodotus does live in this world where the gods were important. I mean, the military leaders and generals and anyone would still consult the Delphic oracles before they did anything. Omens were really, really important to them. Um, so this is woven tightly into the material Herodotus is researching, so people will still use these things. He does quote the oracles that, and the messages that are given because he sees that as part of the explanation. If he asks, why did Sparta do this, and they say mm. the oracle said this, he can't just go, no, nah, I'm not going to believe that. So he lives in this religious, myth-believing world, and he can't necessarily wander around Greece going, no, nope, the gods aren't real, the gods aren't real, it's all nonsense, because bad things would happen to him. <laughs> does, he, does he try and explain things, even though he includes the gods in his work, does he try and explain things from a different point of view, not, you know, yeah, is so there another reason why something could have happened and it not be linked to the gods? Yeah, so absolutely. Try he, and doesn't put that really do, he doesn't really do divine causation. So it's not like Homer, where in Homer, in the Iliad, Diomedes rocks up onto a battlefield um, and Apollo comes down and helps him and then he fights it. The gods don't, like, rock up on a battlefield and start yeah. fighting when people. Apollo came and got that guy off the pyre. Well, he didn't come down, he said he was praying to him. So right. we're, we're not full rain. mythology, we're moving away. But yeah, there's a good example that we'll cover later on where um, the common story in Herodotus' time is that the Corinthians are running away from this battle, but they're told to turn back by a ghost ship. I, yeah, why not? But Herodotus himself says, no, nah, I'm not having a ghost <laughs> ship, that's nonsense. So he, it's his context. He is where he is, and... He's writing in the world he lives in. So don't be too mean to him. Uh, so we've mentioned a couple of times. Uh, he's Greek. Does that give him a bias? A bit harsh. <laughs> well, <laughs> Boo! Uh, does that give him like a bias when he's writing these histories? Yeah, the fact that he's a Greek writing about the Persians and he's writing shortly after the Greeks and Persians have just had a massive war, you would think, actually, it would be a real problem. Um, you'd think it'd be very much kind of like... Um, those kind of mid 1960s Second World War films where all the Nazis have got monocles. Yeah. And yeah. It's not that pantomime. He is Greek, but um, a lot of it comes from the, prob the issue we have with Persian sources. We've said before that Persian sources are quite um, logistical, they're um, contractual, the things like the, 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 the receipt for a donkey. Yeah. So at the time, the Greeks really are the people who are pushing this kind of narrative tradition. So he's probably best placed to record a history. He is Greek, and they've just won, but he's not a gloating Greek. I think it Did could be because he's from Halicarnassus, and they switched sides during this war. Is this when they came out of the war? Yeah, this is when they, they came out of, the, empire, out of the Persian Empire. He's under this free Ionian state. So did he fight in the war? No, he would okay. have been far too... He would have been alive, but he'd been too young. Right, okay. Um, so he's not as chest-beating as he'd expect from a victorious Greek. And interestingly, Plutarch, who, whilst being a very good writer, actually calls Herodotus the father of lies, <laughs> and it's instantly in my bad books every time that comes up. Quite like him. <laughs> he wrote a whole essay about why Herodotus is not good. I used to like you, Plutarch. Um, <laughs> Plutarch accuses Herodotus of being philobarbarous. Philobar yeah. <laughs> that sounds like a really good accusation to level. <laughs> you level are philobarbarous. And basically it means he's too nice to the Persians. Right, okay. Plutarch accuses him of being balanced and nice about the enemies of Greece. But I'm okay. sure that some people, just to flip it, I'm sure that some people would say that Plutarch was a little bit too nice about some people as well, wouldn't they? Because he was sometimes quite nice about the Egyptians. Yeah. About Cleopatra. It's only well, the same thing. Yeah, Plutarch's got his own problems. So he needs to leave <laughs> Plutarch alone. But the other thing is... He's not doing anything to Plutarch. It's absolutely, it's absolutely fine if he's primarily using Greek sources because that's what he's got. Does he but actually he was refer using Persian to sources. the Persian sources as well, though? To yeah, so because balance. of where he's geographically from, he will have had equal access to Greek, Persian, and then later Egyptian sources. So he casts his net wide. So he's not as biased as you think. Yeah. I mean, you clearly are, so I don't know whether that's <laughs> <you're> <laughs> that. 
So another accusation that we need to level at Herodotus is that he is far too much pro-Athenian. So he's too nice to the Athenians in his work. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, he he is our, he is accused of being pro-Athenian at various points. Um, and yes, we should point out that he's being paid by the Athenians to write mm. this history. Ah, mm. okay. Um, and there are some obvious bits. I mean, to be fair to him, uh, they just gave him the money. We do know he went to Thebes and asked them to pay him to write the history of the... Uh, uh, Greek Persian Thebes War. or Egyptian Thebes? Greek Thebes. Okay. Um, they turned him down. So then he went to Athens and went, yeah, we're into that kind of thing. So here's a load of money. So yeah, he does, you can accuse him of being pro-Athenian, but no more than any other writer from the time. Um, saying he's pro-Athenian, he also has real fondness for other Greek states. He's quite fond of Sparta. Even when he writes about people like Cyrus the Great and even Cambyses in his early years, he's quite fair and he's quite balanced. When you get to the later Persian kings, like Xerxes particularly, who directly challenges Athens, that's where you can start to see the pro-Athenian influence. I was going to say, you can't through. gloss over the fact that if it's the person that's paying you, they've got a no. vested interest I was, I was just in say, what you it, are writing. I was so. going to ask, is, this, is it purely like just because they were like his patrons, or is it geographical? Where's Halicarnassus compared to like Athens? Halicarnassus is on the other side of the Aegean. Right, okay. So it's most, yeah, it's largely that they were his paymasters. Okay. But also as well, if he's primarily writing in Athens, a lot of the sources he's going to get are going to be from the Athenians. So that is going to massively affect his reliability of what he's writing? Not massively, because we oh. do know the Athenians were pretty much the only people writing things down in great detail. Sparta didn't write much. Well, the yeah. Persians wrote receipts. It's more to do, and the way he's most pro-Athenian actually is not against the Persians, it's against people like the Thebans. Because okay. Athens and Thebes did not get on at all. Um, and we'll, later when we look at the Battle of Thermopylae, the Thebans don't come out very well from it. Oh, okay. Uh, so I can physically see his book in front of me. <laughs> um, could one say he has a tendency to waffle a bit? Yeah, right, fair cop. I've got is, no comeback for that. Is this also something that you're modelling yourself on, <laughs> Mr. Ridgley? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm not the one who spent a good few portions of this podcast talking about James's hair. <laughs> Still not forgiving. Oh, no. oh, well, um, <laughs> yeah, fair cop. Herodotus is the Grandpa Simpson of ancient historians. He'll start one story and tell you another story <laughs> in the middle. Um, yeah. He does waffle too much, but again, in his defence, and it's not, it's a weak defence. He's very keen to like... He is. And also, that is the one thing that as a, as a history teacher, you constantly say to the kids that you teach, don't waffle, <laughs> and yet you've got like the, the king historian, apparently. It's not the he's king historian, he's the first historian. The first historian, and he is waffling away and rambling on, <laughs> so it's not setting a very good example, is it, for later? It's, no, it's not, and certainly, yeah, he's not to the point, but what you do get from Herodotus that you don't get from other similar sources is you get more than just the story he's telling, so he doesn't just tell you about why the Greeks and Persians went to war, you, from it you can learn a lot more, you find out more about how the Greeks did things, Greek towns, Greek cultures, he just doesn't take you to the battlefield, he takes you to the Agora or to the temple, or so you get a, mo a broader understanding of Greece and the Greeks than just a war. Okay. But he does waffle. Sorry. So the next thing that we've got a problem with is that he doesn't know himself whether what he's writing is actually right. So there are examples, aren't there, of when he's putting down multiple different versions of events. Absolutely. And he doesn't know which is, is the right one. Is this kind of like one. the death of uh, Cyrus, where he's just like, there's two completely different things. Well, the different version of the death of Cyrus comes from another writer. Ah, okay. But yeah, there are examples where Herodotus says, I think this is the more plausible right, account, right. or this is a different account. And <coughs> again, yeah, he has no way of fact-checking. Um, bear in mind, we can barely fact check some things from various political tweets yeah. now. Um, he had no chance 2,000 years ago. So yeah, he doesn't know which one is right, but in his defence, um, where he has conflicting stories, he will often 
present both, or where he thinks he knows which one is more feasible, and say, this is the more feasible. Yeah, you can criticise him, but even now, we, we still have the same problems. We're still not 100% certain about various things. Even later ancient historians, Suetonius and Tacitus as well, they also give multiple versions of events because they have no way of knowing. Even, I mean, look at the death of Harold Godwinson in the Battle of Hastings. How did he die? Arrow in the eye. Apparently not. <laughs> not according to the Anglo Saxon Chronicle. Apparently he was disemboweled. Oh, really? See, it's not just Herodotus. <coughs> it's, it's the same old problem. It's the problem with the accuracy of his sources and his information. So don't be mean. Uh, so some of it, some of what he writes seems to not be particularly relevant to what he's talking about at the time. I don't know what you mean. <laughs> it's not at all like the whole of Book Two of Herodotus is just for some reason describing Egypt. Was he just kind of sussing, trying to suss it out for his next holiday? Is that what it is? Well, I think realistically, it's he was there. He quite liked it, and he wanted to write about it. So. Yeah, he goes in, he spends a whole book basically describing Egypt. He talks about how long the coastline is, which is not right. He talks about um, I mean, how, how would you measure that, though? How would he have measured the coastline? With a ruler? <laughs> <laughs> With a very long tape measure. No, he's, he's found out, he's come to Egypt, he's found out lots of things about it. He finds it fascinating. He talks about Egyptian temples and religion and how, you love this, how women pee standing up and men pee sitting down okay yeah i um, mean if that was the case then it would it would solve a lot of cleaning issues that's all i'm gonna say <laughs> right. i think it would cause a lot of cleaning issues but okay <laughs> so yeah there is a large chunk of it that is you can argue is not irrelevant to the question he's asking but again without herodotus we wouldn't necessarily have this view of egypt in at the time but could he not have put that in a separate book like he just from what you just said he seemingly just yeah, inserted think, a travel guide into a history yeah chronicle. i think with with this i mean i guess maybe he's worried about how much the athenians would pay him <laughs> or whether they'd pay him for history's book too yeah he's he's gone all in right. he's basically done a lot of research and he spent so long doing it he doesn't want to leave anything out so it's all in there it is and you can it's like the list of ships in homer most people probably just skip it. <laughs> Unless you're planning on going to Egypt 2,000 years ago. I mean, I am, but... <laughs> well, you can't <laughs> because the flights are all cancelled. Damn it! Not an option. Covid! So, another thing that we can say is that actually he would probably never pass as a modern historian. Because a lot of the key skills that he need, he just doesn't really show them. Um, he might not even pass a history GCSE, to be perfectly honest, because they are very difficult. But these key things, like his source analysis and things like that, that he just doesn't do to the same level that we would expect a historian to do with a modern piece of historical work. Yeah, I mean, he does and he doesn't. He's, we've already said many times, he is critical of his sources he does do the things that historians do so he does look at significance he does look at causation he does look at how different things can be interpreted um but largely what the thing you've got to remember is it's the problem herodotus is he is first but he's it is... the first one to do this there's nothing that comes before him really and the problem with being the first to do something is there's no model to follow it's like the Wright brother, the Wright brothers' air aeroplane. It wasn't a 747. What yeah, were they playing? It was at? rubbish, wasn't it? It was like a big kite that you could sit on, and but it's the first aeroplane. No one had done it before. Similarly, Herodotus is the first historian, so he's balancing this world between kind of mythology and chronicling, and actually creating a new discipline that. That's basically given us jobs. I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, let's not be proud of us. If he wasn't, you, the, you, if he wasn't your mortgage. <laughs> yeah, so he, he is the first, and what you see very quickly following on straight after him, where Herodotus's narrative stops, the Cydides picks right up, and he follows Herodotus's model. He's massively influenced by Herodotus, but at the same time, he ditches a lot of the stuff. That Herodotus includes mostly the fun stuff, and then you get this tiresome 
swamp-like book talking about the Democrats and the oligarchs. I'm sorry, I'm going <laughs> to nod off. Um, but yeah, it's because Herodotus is first. He's balancing this world between literary tradition of the Greeks and an actual historical discipline. I suppose this is the thing, isn't it? It's like a mashup of a piece of literature and, and mythology and then what we would also say is history. Yeah. It's like a combination of all three. And also don't forget, when Herodotus is writing, I mean, there's not really a tradition of learned academia. Mm. Um, it's unlikely when Herodotus was putting this together that it would necessarily be intended to be studied in a university or for an educated elite. It's like, it's some in some ways, it's got one foot in Homer, this idea that this would have been this would be the equivalent of your TV documentary in ancient Greece. Right. Okay. There would be people who would read it or tell the tales, and it would be the entertainment. So this is why he's got to keep the entertainment in, otherwise, no, he wouldn't have survived. As you can tell from my expert reading over these past few <laughs> podcasts, people would obviously queue up from miles around to hear me reading Herodotus. How popular is Tiger King at the moment? So. <laughs> it, yeah, but he, yeah, he wouldn't. Would he pass a modern history GCSE? Probably not. Um, would he be? Would he get a job in a university now as a historian? No, because we know he just includes some fanciful stories. <laughs> um, but again, it's almost unfair to judge him by modern standards. In the same way that, like, yeah, the Wright brothers. Well, they could only get one person on their plane. What's the point in that? <laughs> So I think we need your kind of final argument then, our closing argument, Mr. My Mitchell, closing to, statement. Your closing <laughs> statement as to why we should use Herodotus for our studies, even though there are obviously all of these issues with him as a historian. Well, because he's great. That's not, that is not <laughs> yeah. a okay point um, on his own. You need to back that up. He's far more interesting than Niall Ferguson. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that Niall Ferguson is interesting and if you don't know who Niall Ferguson is then that's good because you don't really need to. <laughs> no, he, he, yeah, he's got his flaws um, but again we've got to be careful if we're wafting this floor brush around ancient history. No one's coming out clean. Well, sure. No one gets away lightly even like the big Roman writers Tacitus and Suetonius they've got flaws all over the shop. They're like, <laughs> they're like the Mariana Trench Suetonius. I mean, just leave, just leave Octavian in. out of this. Yeah, well he just wrote oh. his own history didn't he? Oh god he, You've got to stick up for your boyfriend if he's sticking up with it. That's it, that's it. <laughs> so yeah, Herodotus, he has his flaws, like all ancient historians, but in some ways this makes it more pleasant. If you take all the flaws and the fun stuff out, you're left with Thucydides. And I'll just stop there for <laughs> insulting Thucydidean fans. Um, no, he is definitely worth studying. He gives us a clear narrative in amongst the rambling. He is arguably the most credible source we have for the time. Um, it is detailed, it is clearly well researched, he establishes a discipline and a dynasty that has put food on my table for 20 years, <laughs> and yours Taylor. Mm. Um, but no, it, as a source, as long as you can sift out, as long as you can just read the fun bits or the silly bits and put them aside and go, but they're clearly silly bits, he is a relatively reliable source. In some ways he's more reliable than others because the made up the ridiculous bits are so ridiculous that you've got no option other than to go well that's clearly not true that man didn't escape on a dolphin we have to be careful don't we because we know that some people would actually possibly read this and think it was true let's not forget <laughs> that snoop dogg thought that uh, game of thrones was a documentary so there are people stupid enough out there that could possibly read this and think it all actually happened as it's written yeah, um, I'm not sure what we can... I don't think it's fair to blame Herodotus <laughs> for dumb people. <laughs> yeah, that, Leave him alone, that's, that's not his fault. Yeah. Um, but no, in, in terms of... Without Herodotus, the body of information we'd have, particularly about the Persians, would be some guy bought an ass, um, Darius did bad things to people, and Cyrus and had horses. Oh God, don't bring the horses... <laughs> We've got a we've got a whole day without mentioning them. Not anymore. So yes, why study Herodotus? Because he's great. 
So, Judge James, what yes. is your final <laughs> verdict? Should Herodotus be binned? I mean, am I just judge here? Am I also jury and executioner? Because I, I, I oh, bring oh, all of them. Oh. All things to all men. Yes. As you um, all know. I'm basically Judge Dredd in this scenario. Yeah. Um, I don't think we should bin him off. Yeah. Because, uh, like I think you just said earlier, if seemingly without him, this massive and quite important bit of history would just have no... We, we, we We'd know about it. the guy who bought an ass. Yeah, and you wouldn't have an account of it. So other than the, the the inscription on the mountain, it seems like we'd have very little to go off of. It probably should come with a disclaimer. I think it should yeah. come with a warning sticker yes. that says something along the lines of... If warning, believe, this is too much fun! <laughs> if like, you believe everything in this book, then you are a dumbass. Health. Yeah, like And some... you are not intelligent enough to be reading books like this. Go and find a picture book instead. <laughs> yeah. Like some, some, um, some films and books come with, you know, the characters de described in this are purely fictitious. Yeah. Any, any like relevance to anyone living or dead is coincidental. Should be something similar to that in this. Just like, this happened, but sort of. But, but, but not as written in this book. No woman can grow vines out of her vagina. <laughs> <laughs> Only babies. <laughs> you say that with a great degree of certainty, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure you can't sprout a tree from your bits, Mr. Midgley. That's all I'm going to say. Never say never. <laughs> oh, but I would agree with you, James. I think, yes, we do need to keep him as much as I hate making <laughs> Mr. Mitchell smile. I would agree that we need to keep him. Um, yeah. But I think you just, you need to read him with a... Big pinch of salt. Of the word. A ladle yeah. of salt. Yeah, you need to read him, but just kind of with a critical eye. That's what I was thinking. Like anyone doing ancient history. Exactly, <laughs> and make sure you're using them source analysis skills to full effect. And common sense. Yes. So there you have it, the successful trial of Herodotus. Um, we hope this has been useful. Thank you for listening. Leave us a comment below. And until next time, goodbye. Bye. Bye.